Far too often, we find ourselves looking ahead in life. We often fail to take in precious moments. To take time, just to look around and notice what's actually going on around us. We don't take the time to anchor ourselves in present moments and just be in the place where our two feet are standing. But as everyone looks forward or inward, there are many of us who look outward. And more importantly, as it pertains to this episode, upward. I have been fascinated by outer space for as long as I can remember. Growing up, I, like most, even had the glow in the dark stars on my bedroom ceiling. And ever since, I've been fascinated by the cosmic blanket that the Earth is wrapped in. Far more intriguing is the question that always lingers. Are we alone? Many might offer the explanation that we're it. There's no one else. That explanation is always given by those who are either one, afraid. They fail to grasp the sheer infinite expanse of our universe, the one our pale blue dot is dancing through. Surely, if we are a one in a million cosmic experiment of some deity we can't comprehend, or if we're just plain lucky, from centuries of the perfect conditions and evolution, it's asinine to think that we're alone in the universe. As such, that often brings us into contact with things we can't explain, mysterious objects in our sky that present themselves with vivid colors and impossible speeds. The reports of little gray men who visit us learning and sharing their knowledge of the universe and others who want to study our biology and experiment on us. Then there are the reports of those who have been subjected to the most gruesome treatments and torture and then wake up where they always were, as though they had never been gone at all. In the late 1940s, following the Roswell incident that I covered for you in Chapter 8, There were various sightings and engagements between citizens and members of the military from the United States by visitors from other worlds. They eventually became so prevalent that the United States Air Force even shifted how it viewed unidentified flying objects, a view that eventually led to the creation of a top secret, at the time, U.S. program known as Project Blue Book. This week, you'll learn of these strange, special, and remarkable encounters before we move on to Project Blue Book next week. This is a brand new chapter of the Insidious Agenda podcast. As always, I'm your host, Nick, and this is part one of chapter 46, titled Close Encounters, The Dawn of Project Blue Book. Before we dive into the incidents that I'll discuss in today's episode, it's important that we touch on one of the key contributions to our understanding of life outside our Earth and one of the central figures in ufology, or the study of unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrials, a professor from THE Ohio State University and a famed astronomer named Joseph Allen Hynek. Also, for the purposes of this episode, I'll refer to the objects in the sky as UFOs, the way they were back then. For in modern day, 
we now refer to them as UAPs, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. What exactly Hynek's contributions were to UFO study, and the projects that preceded Blue Book, I'll get into next week. But his story is very interesting, especially when you consider his change in views over time, from being a skeptic to a believer. A lot of you listening might actually be more familiar with this contribution than you might think. This work was first released in Alan Hynek's 1972 book titled The UFO Experience, A Scientific Inquiry. Hynek gave humans the first way to categorically measure our interactions with our interstellar visitors in what's known as Hynek's scale. More often, you'll hear this referred to by another term, close encounters. It wouldn't be until 1977 and the release of the Hollywood movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind that humanity really began to adopt the term and to use it, and Hynek does make a brief cameo towards the end of that movie. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It still holds up today. Hynek's scale breaks close encounters into three distinct categories, with three types of, well, let's say, less close encounters preceding them. The first is quite frequent, and often the most reported UFO encounter simply referred to as nocturnal lights. These are lights seen in the night sky and can incorporate all different sorts of behaviors, changes in speed, altitude, and distance with the ability to come just outside of 150 meters before being labeled a close encounter. Sometimes these reports can come from confused onlookers, simply mistaking them for things like airplanes and helicopters. I'm not saying that's all reports, but it might explain some of them. As for those exhibiting a light display, something like a disco ball or sharp, erratic movement, well, those just might be something else. The second is daylight discs. Quite simply, UFOs that are witnessed in broad daylight and, at the time of the creation of Hynek's scale, were flying disks, or oval-shaped. That has changed over time with reports of triangular objects and others of strange creation. The third is radar visual, in which control towers or other monitoring stations pick up the UFO on radar and are able to track it by instruments. At times, even without visual confirmation. More frequently than not, these types of encounters are often debated due to objects in the atmosphere and the concept of atmospheric propagation anomalies. Without getting too sciency for you, it often means that radars will pick up ground clutter due to the combination of unusual mixtures of temperature and humidity in the atmosphere. Now the first true category of close encounters is CE1, or close encounters of the first kind. These are similar to aforementioned instances, however, they are more centered on visual confirmation of UFOs. These sightings must occur at a proximity of 150 meters or less, so we're talking up close and personal. Quite often, it's through the first kind that we often get intricate details about what spacecraft look like, such as smoother rough edges, and any indication of an external propulsion system. One of the easiest ways to differentiate CE-1s from their counterparts is that CE-1s happen exclusively in the sky. Thus, they leave no physical evidence they were present just whatever eyewitness testimony that may exist. Next, we have close encounters of the second kind, or CE2. This is an encounter with a UFO, where some kind of physical evidence has been left behind. Often, it's represented by interference with electronic devices, 
or instruments. It might also cause reactions in animals, inducing a notable flight or fight response. It may also have a physiological effect on the witness, such as temporary paralysis, a feeling of searing heat, or just a general discomfort beyond the induced anxiety and confusion of the encounter. On departure, the craft might even leave impressions on the ground where it rested, scorch marks from liftoff, or some kind of chemical or radioactive residue. When a witness notices animated beings inside or outside the craft is when we progress into close encounters of the third kind, or CE-3. Of course, I'm referring to aliens, or more accurately, extraterrestrials. These can be any kind of animated being imaginable, humanoid, android, hybrid, or simply humans. The latter of which would of course bring theories of time travel or interdimensional transport. But let's not chase the white rabbit here. It's time to wake up, Neo. At this point is where Heineck's scale originally concluded. CE3 wouldn't be expanded upon until the works of ufologist Ted Bletcher. Bletcher put forward six different subtypes of CE3 encounters. They were labeled Alpha through Foxtrot, but they also come with different meanings. Alpha, or aboard, is when beings are noticed aboard the UFO craft, but not outside of it. This might progress into Bravo, or both, where they are noticed inside and outside the craft. Charlie, near the UFO, but not witnessed going inside or outside of it. Delta, or direct, is when only extraterrestrials are noticed, and there's no UFO present. However, UFO activity must have been recently reported, giving that location with time and recency. Echo, or excluded, is when you observe extraterrestrials, but no UFO is present, and no activity has been reported. The final subtype, Foxtrot, or frequency, is that no UFO or extraterrestrials are present, or were reported, but the observer receives or experiences a mental communication, something akin to telepathy. Generally, these are the most accepted types, but there do exist a few more that act as extensions of Heineck's scale. CE4, or close encounters of the fourth kind, are the most frightening. You can probably make an inference here, based on how the scale has progressed, that the fourth kind generally means abduction. This doesn't have to be abduction outright, but can be any instance where the experiencer has transformed view and sense of reality. You might even say it's an individual that might experience hallucinations or strange dreamlike events that are victims of CE4. If you've ever seen the movie The Fourth Kind with Mila Jovovic, they actually do a great job representing what CE4 encounters truly are. For those that haven't, her character in the film Dr. Abigail Tyler uses regression therapy with her clients to get them to relive certain events, ones that have recently taken place. Many of their explanations, and I think this is the perfect explanation for CE4, say that it felt like a dream, but it wasn't a dream. The movie is not based on true events as it claims, but it does do a good job demonstrating what CE4 is. A close encounter of the fifth kind, CE5, is one that was proposed by the founder of the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, or CSETI, a man by the name of Dr. Stephen Greer. This is one that's truly interesting, because it's the only close encounter that's initiated by humans. It's an attempt by groups of humans, through meditative practices, 
to channel their collective energy and consciousness in an attempt to make contact with non-Earth-based civilizations. There's a great video I found in which Dr. Greer explains the process in greater detail, so I'll link that one in the show notes for you to check out on your own. There are sometimes two others that are floated around, which are the sixth and seventh kind. And depending on where you are and what you read, they more often deal with interspecies intimacy or contacts that result in the injury or death of human subjects. It's worth noting that Hynek's scale is one that can slide to the right, but not to the left. A close encounter can progress from sightings, like nocturnal lights, and then from 1 through 3, etc., but can't go back from 3 to 1. Once your close encounter has reached a certain number, then it becomes that type of encounter. If we look at the subjects of Chapter 19, Betty and Barney Hill, their encounter progressed from nocturnal lights right up through the scale in a relatively short amount of time. If you've forgotten their story, it might be the perfect time to go back and have another listen. So now that we've explored types of close encounters, take what you know and try to apply the criteria for each to the following cases I'm about to tell you about. 1947 was a major year, and certainly one of the most notable for UFOs. It comprised of events like the Maury Island incident in June, the famous Kenneth Arnold sighting days later, the Flight 105 UFO sighting, and finally culminated in the event at the height of the flying disc craze, the Roswell incident. Only days after the calendar rolled over into 1948, on the 7th of January, the Godman Army Airfield in Fort Knox, Kentucky, had a call come in from the State Highway Patrol about some kind of unusual aerial object that was flying around near the town of Madisonville. It was a craft moving in a westerly direction and was noticed to be sized around 80 to 90 meters in diameter. The craft was also spotted in the adjacent towns of Owensboro and Irvington. A short while later, around 1.45 p.m., the aircraft was noticed by Sergeant Quinton Blackwell, an air traffic controller who was on duty at the airfield. Two others who witnessed the same craft as Blackwell stated that it was a large, white object off in the distance. When it was examined through binoculars, the craft, from the comments of the base commander, Guy Hicks, stated that the craft was white, with a red border at the bottom, and was roughly one quarter the size of the moon. The aircraft remained in the area, and eventually stopped its movement, hovering, and remained stationary for about 90 minutes. One observer stated that it had the appearance of a flaming red cone that was trailed by some sort of gaseous green mist. In Ohio, At the Lockbourne Army Airfield, witnesses noticed that before the craft departed, it descended very near to the ground, hovering there for about 10 seconds before ascending back to its hovering altitude of 10,000 feet. In its rapid ascension, the craft was believed to have reached a speed in excess of 800 kilometers an hour and disappeared into overcast skies. The tower, wanting a closer look at the object, redirected four of its Mustangs that were already airborne and were conducting maneuvers to approach the object. One of these aircraft was piloted by 25-year-old Second World War veteran pilot Captain Thomas Mantell, who had previously flown the missions of both Normandy and Market Garden. As Mantell's unit approached the aircraft, Two different versions are given for what they saw. In some reports, they describe the object as being incredibly small and indistinct. Others say that Mantell stated the object was metallic and tremendous in size. One of Mantell's fellow pilots 
had to return to station because of low fuel, while, before Mantel's ascent to the object, the other two had to return due to a low supply of oxygen. Mantel continued climbing toward the object, surpassing a height of 25,000 feet. Then, nothing. Thomas Mantell had blacked out from a lack of oxygen, and his Mustang was sent spiraling to the ground in a circular descent. Boom. His plane hits the ground on a farm just outside the town of Franklin, near the Kentucky state border with Tennessee. Thomas Mantell died on impact, with the ground around 3.18 p.m., while the UFO remained visible to the tower until 3.50, when it left sight for good. We're left to wonder how the public looked at this. It's 1948, post-World War II, and it's now a media event. So to you listening, what explanation makes the most sense? Why, of course, it has to be a Soviet missile. Having been sent with love from Moscow all the way across the Pacific Ocean and the western continental United States, all the way to Kentucky, where it collided with Mantell. Sometimes when I say it back like that, it sounds sillier than the first time I read it. An alternative explanation that the media and the public were purporting was that Mantell got too close, and the alien shot him down. Other facts, and I'll use that extremely loosely, were that Captain Mantell's body was recovered, riddled with bullets. His body was found burned. Others state that his body wasn't recovered at all. Some say the plane disintegrated during the ascent altogether. There was never any evidence to substantiate any of those claims. Really, they were just conjecture and wild speculation. Many reports even stated, and get this, that Mantell was killed while trying to fly to the planet Venus. This was mainly because of quick explanations given by the Air Force Research Group that was assigned to investigate the incident. Others have come forward stating that the UFO might have been a U.S. Navy weather balloon. And although it might explain the shape, it doesn't explain the rapid ascent or the descent of the craft in question. Final thoughts on the Mantell case can be summed up on the comments of USAF officer Edward Ruppelt, who will frequently come up next week when we discuss Project Blue Book. Somewhere, in the archives of the Air Force, or the Navy, there are records that will show whether or not a balloon was launched from Clinton County Air Force Base on January 7, 1948. I never could find those records. People who were working with the early Skyhook projects remember operating out of Clinton County Air Force Base in 1947 but refuse to be pinned down to a January 7th flight. Maybe, they said, the Mantell incident is the same old UFO jigsaw puzzle. Thomas Mantell, regardless of UFO involvement or not, is the victim of a tragedy. It's unknown what was going through his head in the last minutes he was alive, but he died in service to his country. He was a hero of the Second World War, having earned the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal with three oak leaf clusters for excellence. During Operation Market Garden, Thomas was able to keep his aircraft in the fight through both anti-aircraft attack and a post-takeoff onboard fire. He was given the nickname Shiny by his squadron mates, both in part due to his constant, well-scrubbed look and the ability to think fast and act quickly. Today, Thomas is buried in the Zachary Taylor National Cemetery in Louisville and is survived by his wife Peggy and his sons Thomas and Terry. If you're ever driving by Franklin, Kentucky, 
as you exit off Interstate 65, you'll see a historical marker dedicated to Captain Thomas Mantell. May he rest in peace. It would be months after the death of Captain Mantell before the next major UFO incident took place. In the early hours of July 24, 1948, a pair of commercial airline pilots, Clarence Childs and John Witted, were flying back a Douglas DC-3 aircraft of Eastern Airlines near the city of Montgomery, Alabama. They were at an altitude of around 5,000 feet. Both men, like Mantell, were veterans of the Second World War, with Childs having flown aircraft transport and witted a pilot of the B-29s. They described their flight back as smooth, with the moon, only four days removed from full, shining through the scattered clouds in their path. It was around 0245 that they first saw it. There was a strange, dull glow flitting just ahead of them, at an altitude just slightly higher than theirs. Their first thought was, Oh look, here comes a new army jet job. The light set upon their aircraft within seconds of them first observing it. It blew right past them. On Witted's side, the right as he was the co-pilot, and with a tremendous burst of flame, shot straight up into the clouds. Their total encounter was only a period of about 10 to 15 seconds. The aircraft appeared to have no wings, and had two rows of windows, from which an extremely bright light emanated, something they could only describe as having the intensity of a magnesium flare. They both saw the same thing. They were sure of it. It was around 30 meters long and about 7.5 to 10 meters wide. It was shaped like a torpedo, or something like a cigar, that they described had something like the fuselage of a B-29. Flames emitted from the tail. It was only noticed by one of the passengers, Clarence McKelvey, who could only ever describe it as a bright streak of light, one that flashed by his window. When the plane touched down at its final destination in Atlanta, Georgia, the pilots reported the unusual occurrence to the U.S. Air Force. The pair were interviewed by investigators from Project Sign, which I'll go into more depth about next week. During their investigation, there were slight differences in what they saw. Childs saw a lit cockpit and a long boom nose, while Witted didn't see a cockpit or a nose, but remembered seeing a series of rectangular windows. Childs' account of the encounter went as follows. An intense, dark blue glow came from the side of the ship. It ran the entire length of the fuselage, like a blue fluorescent light. The exhaust was a red-orange flame, with a lighter color predominant around the outer edges. Just as it went by, the pilot pulled up as if he had seen the DC-3 and wanted to avoid us. There was a tremendous burst of flame from the rear, it zoomed into the clouds, its jet wash rocking our DC-3. Clarence McKelvey, the passenger who witnessed the event, was also interviewed by investigators. He only confirmed what he saw before, that he hadn't seen the shape of it as it streaked past his window, but it was something very intense and nothing like he had ever seen before. So what's different from the child's witted incident from the Mantell incident. Well, according to Edward Ruppelt, this one shook the investigator's psyche. After all, these were two credible witnesses who saw it up close and were alert and were able to recall what they saw. Childs and Witted were very respected pilots that their community thought the world of. Even another Air Force crew at the Robbins Air Force Base in Macon, Georgia, claimed to have witnessed a bright light passing overhead 
on the exact same night. The file that the investigators sent to the Air Force's Chief of Staff, Hoyt Vandenberg, was only an estimate, but it was a thick file with a black cover that was stamped Top Secret. Well, Vandenberg rejected the estimate the following month, stating that the evidence was insufficient to support the conclusions it drew. So forget what the witnesses saw. Right outside their window, someone who wasn't even remotely close said it didn't happen, so it didn't happen. But surely there had to be more. Something else at least. Well, Alan Hynek, who I talked about previously, concluded that the pilots actually saw a meteor. After all, it was a period of increased meteoric activity. A quick, bright flash, complete with a vibrant tail, is an explanation consistent with a meteor. Those involved in Project Sign, however, disagreed with Hynek's diagnosis of the object. Although there was no further explanation given, other than, it is obvious that this object was not a meteor. They believe it should remain unidentified, though. But upon review years later, many tended to agree with Hynek. In my brief review of the case, I just don't understand how a meteor can travel laterally past an aircraft and then exhibit a flash of flame and shoot straight upward, especially when you consider that the object would have had to come in a downward direction from space, so lateral movement doesn't seem plausible. When you consider the object was already in the atmosphere, it would have been subject to Earth's gravitational pull, which means that if it was traveling laterally, it would have had to have some kind of propulsion system. So I'm not sure if it's physically possible that the meteor could have, you know gone laterally and straight upward. But people that have gone to school a lot longer than I have think it's a meteor. So we'll go with that. Even if for some reason it just still doesn't sit right with me. I suppose it could also have been some kind of weird illusion. But I wasn't there. It's also worth mentioning that only days before the child's witted encounter, reports emerged from The Hague in the Netherlands about an aircraft that was noticed moving swiftly through the clouds, and ones that matched the description given by our pilots. Another report, stemming from the Air Force's Clark Field in the Philippines, bore a close similarity to that of The Hague. Much of the intrigue surrounding the child's witted encounter is centered on the report that was generated, which is referred to as the estimate of the situation. From Edward Ruppelt's book, The Report of Unidentified Flying Objects, that he wrote in 1956, he discerns the following. In intelligence, if you have something to say about some vital problem, you write a report that's known as an estimate of the situation. A few days after the DC-3 was buzzed, the people at ATIC decided that the time had arrived to make an estimate of the situation. The situation was UFOs. The estimate was that they were interplanetary. It was a rather thick document, with a black cover, and it was printed on legal-sized paper. Stamped across the front were the words, Top Secret. It contained the Air Force's analysis of many of the UFO incidents, plus many similar ones. All of them had come from scientists, pilots, and other equally credible observers, and each one was an unknown. When the estimate was completed, typed, and approved, it started up through the channels to higher command echelons. It drew considerable comment but no one stopped it on its way up. No copies of this near-legendary document have surfaced since. So here's my non-scientific, amateur podcaster analysis on the situation. From the top, two credible pilots and one passenger 
saw something. They saw it streak past their window. They both saw vibrant flames, and then it shot up into the clouds. This was also seen in Macon, where there were reports not only days before of a similar sighting in Europe and all the way in the Philippines. It was during a period of intense meteoric activity, but both pilots described seeing an aircraft of a long, cylindrical variety, much like a cigar. Reports of unidentified craft in our atmosphere have been made many times since. The maneuvers and speed reported by the pilots don't match that of any other aircraft. The key report to the situation was reviewed, quickly, dismissed, and hasn't been seen since. It's entirely possible that the document is still highly classified. But why? If there wasn't sufficient evidence to prove that the object was a UFO, what purpose is served by keeping the document under wraps? The only thing I can chalk it up to, and quite simply as the old saying goes, I believe that someone is hiding something. As the calendar months trickled by into the fall of 1948, it didn't take our visitors from distant worlds long to make their presence known again. Our final story this week picks up on the 1st of October in the cockpit of George Gorman's Mustang fighter. Taking part in the cross-country flight that day with other pilots of the National Guard, 2nd Lieutenant George Gorman, another veteran of the Second World War, was entering the city of Fargo in the state of North Dakota around 8.30 p.m. The other pilots of his unit all descended into Hector Airport while Gorman made the decision to remain airborne. He wanted to take advantage of the clear, cloudless sky that evening. Around 9 p.m., Gorman's aircraft passed over a stadium where a local high school football game was taking place when he noticed a smaller aircraft, a Piper Cub, about 500 feet below him. There was no other traffic in the area that appeared on radar. It was only through visuals that he picked up another object, something flying just off to the west. There were no visible features of this being a traditional aircraft. It had no discernible wings, nor a fuselage. Strangely enough, it also appeared to be blinking. His radio call over to the air control tower at Hector confirmed that the only traffic on radar in the area were his Mustang and the Piper Cub. A.D. Cannon, the pilot of the Piper Cub, and his passenger confirmed that they, too, were seeing the blinking light. It was airborne and just off to the west. Gorman throttled forward, bringing his speed to around 650 kilometers an hour, and reported to the tower that he intended to pursue the object. The only issue was that Gorman realized, even going as fast as he was, that he was never going to catch the aircraft straight on so he was forced to make cuts and turns in order to cut it off. As he approached it, the object started coming towards him, passing overhead at 500 feet above his aircraft. Gorman later went on to describe what he saw. It was about 6 to 8 inches in diameter, clear white, and completely round with fuzz at the edges. As I approached, however, the light suddenly became steady, and I pulled into a sharp left bank. I dived after it, but I couldn't catch up with the thing. It started gaining altitude, and again made a left bank. I put my aircraft into a sharp turn, and tried to cut the light off. Suddenly, it made a sharp right turn, and we were headed straight at each other. Just when we were about to collide, I, I guess I got scared. I went into a dive and the light passed over my canopy. He lost sight of the object, but it never lost him. The UFO made an immediate 180-degree turn and started tailing Gorman. 
After moments, it shot up into a vertical climb. Gorman gave pursuit, reaching a height of 14,000 feet before his fighter stalled out. At that point, the UFO was around a height of around 16,000 feet. Gorman tried and failed twice more to reach the object, which, by this point, had passed over the airport. The air traffic controller on duty that night, L.D. Jensen, attempted to get a visual through binoculars, but couldn't see any other form around it, just the ball of light. Gorman kept up his pursuit of the strange light, until he was around 25 miles to the southwest of Fargo. He managed to get above it, around the upper limits of his aircraft's capability, and noticed the object at 11,000 feet. He dipped his nose on it, and dove at it with everything the Mustang could give him. The object then flew upward, and out of visual range for Gorman. The pursuit, now famously referred to as the Gorman dogfight, was called off at 2127. Gorman returned to Hector Airport, and brought his plane to ground, but not without struggle. For a veteran who had been a wartime pilot, he was very shaken up, and had a hard time landing his aircraft. Within a matter of hours, the USAF's investigators assigned to Project Sign had descended on Hector Airport, and wanted to interview everyone involved in the encounter. Gorman, Cannon, his passenger, Jensen, and all others on duty in the control tower. Even Gorman's aircraft was examined with a Geiger counter, and was found to have a significant, more amount of radiation present than aircraft who hadn't flown in a few days. They thought this was evidence that Gorman had encountered something that was atomically powered. After taking statements and readings, the investigators determined that something remarkable had occurred that night in North Dakota. Later results offered a more scientific explanation. Investigators stated that any aircraft above ground level is less shielded from radiation than those below, so it made it quite evident why Gorman's aircraft had a higher radiation reading. Also, the Air Weather Service confirmed that they released a lit weather balloon around 8.50 p.m. on the 1st of October. They discerned that the movements Gorman thought he experienced were due to his own maneuvers at the high speed he was traveling and created movements that were illusory in nature. It's also suggested that, as Gorman chased the light fighter and gone further and further from Fargo, that he had actually mistaken the lit object for the planet Jupiter. And because of Jupiter's lack of proximity to Earth, it caused Gorman to eventually give up and return to the airfield. Quite often, this encounter is chalked up to being overrated and doesn't offer solutions for the plausibility of a UFO encounter. On the 23rd of October, Gorman gave a sworn statement to the investigators of Project Sign. I'm convinced that there was a definite thought behind its maneuvers. I am further convinced that the object was governed by the laws of inertia because its acceleration was rapid, but not immediate. And although it was able to turn fairly tight, at considerable speed, it still followed a natural curve. When I attempted to turn with the object, I blacked out temporarily due to excessive speed. I am in fairly good physical condition, and I do not believe there are many if any pilots who could withstand the turn and speed affected by the object, and remain conscious. The object was not only able to outturn and outspeed my aircraft, but was able to attain a far steeper climb, and was able to maintain a constant rate of climb far in excess of my aircraft. We also learn, through a letter sent by Gorman on the 10th of December in 1948, that he was in touch with Kenneth Arnold. Yes, that Kenneth Arnold, whose UFO encounter you'll remember I told you about in the Roswell chapter. There's not much to discern from this letter. However, Arnold had reached out to Gorman previously 
on a number of occasions, and this was the first reply. Gorman touches on the fact that he's effectively under a gag order from Air Material Command, who classified the encounter as secret. Both he and his commanding officer were both under threat of court-martial for speaking out about the incident, but a court-martial that never actually went through. He said he expected to be contacted by the Counterintelligence Corps, and even the FBI, to turn over everything he had on the incident. So here are my thoughts on this case, before I wrap up the episode. Like the child's witted meteor explanation, Jupiter is used here. There are reports that the planet Jupiter might have actually only been on the horizon line that night, or even just below it. Therefore, it doesn't make any sense why Gorman would chase it upward. There's also nothing to explain away its maneuvers. Sure, a weather balloon was launched in the vicinity that evening. However, I'm fairly certain that an experienced pilot could discern a simple weather balloon from something they couldn't explain. Also, we have to factor in the positioning of the aircraft. It was to the west of the airfield, and then over it, and then 25 miles south. I'm hesitant to say, but fairly certain that a weather balloon couldn't move at that velocity in such a shortened amount of time. But this is where the explanations also tie into the Jupiter theory. It still doesn't sit right with me, as Jupiter is, as we all know, way out there. I'm sure Gorman could have differentiated between a star and something that, as he said, passed right over his canopy. Again, a common theme with UFOs and extraterrestrial encounters, someone is hiding something. This was the last major UFO encounter until around midway through 1950. There were three substantial events that occurred in the 50-51 years, which were the McMinnville UFO encounters from which came one of the most iconic UFO photographs in human history. Then there was the Mariana UFO incident, followed by the Lubbock Lights. This was finally enough for the United States Air Force to develop a large program, the largest of its kind, for the study of unidentified flying object phenomena, events that had been captivating the public and confounding scientists for the past five years. In March of 1952, they officially opened Project Blue Book. So this is where I leave you this week. In March of 1952, as the United States Air Force officially opened Project Blue Book. Next week, we'll also explore Project Sign, which was mentioned throughout this episode, in addition to Project Grudge, and finally Blue Book. For more information, please visit our Facebook page for the accompanying blog post and photographs that will add a bit more color to this episode. If you like this story, I'd appreciate you sharing with a friend. If your podcast app allows it, like Spotify, please give the podcast a rating. It helps me out with the algorithm and helps others to discover most of my amazing stories as well. New episodes of the Insidious Agenda podcast release every Tuesday at midnight Eastern Standard Time. But for now, it's time to close the cover of the Insidious Agenda I've been your host, Nick, and I want to thank you very much for listening. Now beam me up, Scotty. <laughs>